Welcome back to Food with Life. So I'm wondering, why do they produce GMO crops? Well, there's two main reasons. The crops are either poison drinking or poison producing. The poison drinking plants are called herbicide tolerant. Mm -hmm. You can spray them with a poison that normally kills all of the plants. It's a weed killer. Mm -hmm. But these Roundup Ready crops can survive doses of normally deadly Roundup herbicide or the Liberty Link crops can survive Liberty herbicide. So it's basically a weed management tool for farmers who can spray the chemical over the entire field and kill all of the other plant biodiversity and the GMO crops survive. Now almost all of the crops are herbicide tolerant and they're sold as a package deal, the seed and the chemical. Yeah. Now there's also a small percentage well, of crops. I also read that this one GMO crops have to use the same, they go together. Yes. The products, they, they're coupled together, so they cannot just buy the one crop without buying that uh, pesticide. In fact, when you buy the Roundup Ready crops, yes. you sign a contract yes. that you'll only buy Monsanto's version of their Roundup, and that forces the farmers to buy Monsanto's products. So it's a way of extending their patent, yes. even though the patent expires. Yes. Yes. Now, the other type of crop is called pesticide producing, mm -hmm. poison producing, mm -hmm. and these have a gene in every cell that produces a toxin that breaks open the intestines or, or whatever the, mm -hmm. the gut of certain insects and kills them. Mm -hmm. Now every single cell has this Bt toxin which is a poison. Now the Environmental Protection Agency actually registers these crops as pesticides mm -hmm. and there's two of them on the market corn and cotton. Mm. And they say, we don't have to test the health of animals and humans eating this poison produced crop because the poison has, they say, has a history of safe use. Mm. You see, the gene that they put into the crop comes from the soil bacterium called Bt. Mm -hmm. And even in its natural state, as a bacteria, it's sprayed onto crops and has for years to kill insects. But they take the gene that produces the toxin and they insert it into the DNA of corn and cotton mm -hmm. so that the plants do the killing. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, the natural spray isn't safe. Mm -hmm. When it was sprayed for gypsy moth infestation in the Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. hundreds of people got allergic and flu-like symptoms. Some had to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now in India... And they're associated with the spray. Yeah, they, they got sprayed by the BT spray. Documented. Uh, yes, it's in published peer-reviewed studies. Mm -hmm. Now that's the natural spray. Mm -hmm. Then they take the gene that creates that poison and they put it into cotton plants. And now thousands of farm workers in India who are picking cotton mm -hmm. are getting the same allergic and flu-like symptoms as those who were sprayed. Mm -hmm. But it gets worse. Then they allow their animals to graze on the cotton plants after harvest, mm -hmm. and thousands of sheep, buffalo, and goats have died. I visited one town in Andhra Pradesh in India, mm -hmm. and they had allowed their buffalo to graze on regular cotton plants for eight years without a problem. But they allowed their buffalo to graze for a single day on these genetically modified BT cotton plants, mm -hmm. and within three days all 13 of their buffaloes had died. <laughs> Now, when they feed regular BT, the natural BT, mm -hmm. not the genetically modified, the natural BT, when they feed that to mice, the mice get an immune response. Mm -hmm. They also discovered when they feed BT corn, the genetically engineered corn introduced, when they introduced that gene to create the toxin, when they feed that to mice, the mice get an immune response. Mm -hmm. Then they took corn, which was a combination of BT and Roundup Ready, mm -hmm. so it was poison drinking and poison producing. And the government of Austria did a study, and they fed it to mice, and the more corn that was fed to mice, the less babies they had, and the smaller the babies were. <laughs> then someone reanalyzed Monsanto's own studies on rats, 
and found that even though Monsanto said no problem whatsoever with the BT corn, mm. the independent scientist reanalyzed the raw data with proper statistics and said toxic effects. Wow. So we see in the food that we eat, in the corn that we eat, mm. is a built-in toxin. Now Chapati, there's one study that I have it, to share with you. It's poison. Yeah. It's I, poison. I think so. For the human system. Well, it, it shows that it reacts it's, to animals and reacts to humans. Now, there's only been one human feeding study on GMOs, mm -hmm. which should shock you because they're feeding these products of an infant science Millions. to the entire population. Millions. One study showed, it was done on genetically modified soybeans, mm -hmm. and they found that part of the gene that was inserted into the soy that allows the soy to be sprayed with Roundup herbicide, mm -hmm. that gene transferred into the DNA of the bacteria living inside the intestines in human beings and continued to function. Mm. They had Roundup ready gut bacteria, unkillable with Roundup herbicides in their intestines. Now this means long after we stop eating genetically modified foods, mm -hmm. we may still have this inside us. Now, what if you eat a corn chip that's genetically engineered BT corn? Mm -hmm. What if the gene transfers to your gut bacteria? Mm -hmm. It might turn it into living pesticide factories, mm -hmm. continually producing the BT toxin mm -hmm. inside. This is not good news. So this can lead to many illnesses, many when, illnesses. When I talk, you know, when GMOs were introduced in 1996, 7% mm -hmm. of Americans had three or more chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. Nine years later, it went to 13%. Mm -hmm. Food-related illnesses in the U.S. doubled between 94 and 2001. Uh, food allergies, especially among kids, have skyrocketed. Soon after GM soy was introduced to the UK, soy allergies skyrocketed by 50%. We know that the GM soy has higher levels of a known allergen, mm -hmm. as much as seven times higher in cooked GM soy. It apparently has a, a new allergen that's different than wild soy. Mm -hmm. It has higher levels of toxic Roundup on it. There's a lot of reasons mm -hmm. why GM soy and GM corn mm -hmm. may be responsible or contributing to the higher rate of allergies among mm. children. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Now, don't go away. I have Mr. Smith. He's going to give us another opportunity for you to get more knowledge and wisdom on GMO foods and what they can do for you or not do for you. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Food with Life. Welcome back to Food with Life. And what about other illnesses? Cancer and all these other things. You, you know, know, I gave a... Immunology, I... you know, the body's ability to push away disease. Well, you see, the immune system responds when it interprets something as foreign and dangerous. Mm -hmm. But GMOs, by definition, have something foreign. And, many pe and every single study that looked at immune system responses properly showed an immune system response. Mm. So now we have autoimmune diseases. I gave a lecture at a, at a medical conference mm -hmm. called GMOs, Inflammation, and Autoimmune Disease. We filled an hour of slides of studies and interpretations showing how these particular crops when fed to animals, caused inflammation responses, immune responses. And some of these studies were government-sponsored studies. Mm. So we believe that GMOs are a major contributor to many of the serious problems which have been on the rise since 1996. Mm. But how can you tell? Mm. You see, there's no post-marketing surveillance of the population, no human clinical trials, hardly any long-term animal feeding studies. The company themselves do rigged research, and many of the approvals are based on assumptions which have already shown to be untrue. So, how can we do something? There are many people that are environmentally conscious, not only external environment, but the internal environment. How can we do something? Apparently, this there's administration and government is locked solid in this biotech thing going on. How can we turn this around? What is your suggest? The best way to turn this around is by creating a tipping point of consumer rejection against genetically modified foods. Now, this happened in Europe. Within a single week, virtually every major food company committed to stop using GM ingredients. And that was at the end of April of 1999. And that was because of a single high-profile GMO food safety scandal, where a scientist who had been gagged and unable to speak about his research mm -hmm. was ungagged, and 750 articles were written about mm -hmm. it, and everyone got the clue that GMOs were dangerous. But it wasn't reported in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, in the U.S., we've been educating consumers about the health dangers of genetically engineered bovine growth hormone. 
which is injected into cows to increase milk supply, but increases a risk factor for cancer in the milk. Mm. And as a result, Walmart kicked it out of its brands, and Dannon and Yoplait from its uh, yogurts, and uh, Starbucks from its stores. In fact, most of the top 100 dairies have kicked out milk products that use RBGH, or bovine growth mm -hmm. hormone, because of our co coalition's collective. consumer education yes, campaign. Collective so, so your audience, mm -hmm. if they become clued in to the dangers of GMOs, mm -hmm. they can go to non-gmoshoppingguide.com and get a shopping guide and see what products are GMO and what products are non-GMO. Mm -hmm. They can make healthier choices for themselves. And we think that when about 5% of U.S. shoppers stop eating genetically modified foods. Mm -hmm. That's all we need to create a tipping point. Yes. Because GMOs give no consumer benefits. They're either poison producing or poison drinking. Right. And so as soon as they start dropping the market share of these major companies, mm -hmm. they will do what they've already done in Europe and Japan mm -hmm. and simply replace their corn and soy ingredients with non-GM corn and soy. And they will eliminate all the other genetically modified inputs. Mm -hmm. well, we think our audience should watch and consider making a difference in their lives, in their body's lives, and in the life of well-being, enjoying being happy and all this, without getting uh, very much into sickness and illness. So we strongly encourage our audience to think twice about buying their food, and reading the labels, and, and uh, that's something we'll talk more about when we are in our kitchen food segments. So. I want to thank you again. We'll see you in just a few minutes in the kitchen. All right? Very good. Thank you, Jeffrey Smith, our wonderful guest, genius and wonderful spokesperson on GMO. Stay with us. This is Food with Life. Hello, and welcome back to Food with Life. I'm your Chapati with our wonderful guests here, and Jeffrey Smith, our expert on GMO and foods. Uh, you talked about corn. I know you mentioned that. And we're going to make something with corn in it, yes? Yes, we're going to make some absolutely wonderful corn cakes. We're going to use organic corn masa. Now, masa is very important here, the distinction between masa and cornmeal. You want organic corn masa for this. In corn masa has been processed with a little bit of lime, and it makes it adds a little bit of flavor and also makes it easier to digest. Wonderful. So we're going to use two cups of organic corn masa. This happens to be white. You can buy white, yellow, blue. I like the white. Very flavorful. It has a little bit of sweetness to it. So it's just a difference in the flavor, yes? Yeah, a little bit different in the flavor. There's a little bit difference in the texture at times. Mm. Um, those t couple of things. And the sweetness is something that comes out in the white. Mm. Very, very nice. And visually it's a little different. And that's a big part of eating, is mm. visual. Yes. So to those two cups of organic corn masa, we're going to add just couple of sprinkles of salt, and this is sea salt again. Wonderful sea salt. It's very important for sea salt. Yes. And then I've also diced, finally, a half of a zucchini and half of a yellow squash. This is a round patty pan. And you can use any type of vegetable that you like, but this particular combination I think is very flavorful and also uh, easily cooks because it's important that this is going to cook very quickly and you want this to cook but have a little bit of texture and the zucchini will maintain its texture very nicely in this amount of cooking. So that also goes into here. Mm. And then to that we're going to add two cups of water. So simple, two cups of corn masa, two cups of water, a couple of teaspoons, or actually a couple of pinches, uh, sprinkles of salt, sea salt, and then you're going to add your vegetable, which we have, and you're going to use this wonderful tool called a Danish dough hook. And you can use your hands if you like, but the Danish dough hook makes it really simple to just whisk everything together. And if you need to, you can always add a little bit more water to it. Always better to have a little bit less than too much at the beginning. And you want your dough to be a little wet, not too wet, but a little wet because you don't want when you feel it, you don't want any of that grittiness of the, the masa, of the flour itself. So we're going to do this just like this for just about 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and then we're going to feel it. And then you want to feel this chapati? It feels you can good. feel how it feels. Yeah, it feels you great. It's you ready play for with the, it. It's just like a being a kid again, right? <laughs> You're ready, you ready you for can the cake, it. yes? Yeah, it's wonderful. You can smell it too. You can you smell can really it. really smell it when mm. you're it. smells it delicious. It. <laughs> and actually, chapati, when you put it all together, this is what it's going to look like. A nice big yeah. ball. Play-doh. 
And the, the great thing about this is, rather than like bread where you're going to have to put it all together and then you're gonna to have to knead it for five, 10, 15, 20 minutes, no kneading, it's finished, this is it. Ready to rock and roll, make your corn cakes. Now, what's so really interesting about these corn cakes is that you can do all kinds of very fun things with them. You can make them ethnically diverse. So for example, what do I mean by that, ethnically diverse? Well, can I guess? Please do. You can put a different vegetable in according to some place it comes from. You can. You can put a hat with fruit on the top. And you a little can, <laughs> could do that, Jeffrey, yes. But what you really can do to make the, it ethnically diverse, that's not easy to say, is you can add the different spices and herbs based on what type of region you want it to come from. So, for example, this is cumin, mm. ground toasted cumin. It's very nice to toast your spices first before, if you have whole spices, toast them and then grind them and it brings out the flavor in them. So, toasted cumin, we're just going to put a little bit in here and we're going to take it and mix it all together. And what we've got now is something that is going to serve as the basis for our Mexican corn cake. Oh. And then we're going to add wonderful toppings to it later. So, the other thing about this is you don't need a tortilla press, you don't need any kind of equipment, you just use your hands and you flatten the dough out very, very nicely like this, and you're ready to go. So that's one particular one that we can do. We can also add, for example, we have some Italian herbs. This is a combination of dried thyme and dried oregano, and we can put that into one. Again, you're just taking a little bit of handful of the dough, you're adding your herbs to it, but uh, for dried herbs in this type of thing, you could use dried thyme, dried oregano, like we're doing dried rosemary. I wouldn't use either because it's too sticky. Mm. And, and I don't mean in terms of the texture. I mean in terms of stick-oriented, and so it can sometimes get you in different areas of the mouth when you, when you bite into it. So this, look, you can see this really nicely now. It has the dried herbs mixed into it, and it will add such a nice layer of flavor to it. And again, we're going to finish it off with a special type of topping. Very, very special. Good. All right. It is it, huh? You yes. mentioned that this is white corn. Yes. It's interesting that the percentage of genetically modified corn in the United States is much higher in yellow corn mm. than white corn. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they haven't yet genetically modified blue corn. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean you're off the hook because there could be cross pollination even if you buy blue corn. Mm. I'm your host, Chapati. We'll see you in just a minute. This is Food with Life. Welcome back to Food with Life. After we make the patties, then what we want to do is we want to cook them on a griddle. That's the best surface to do this with. I particularly like cast iron, so that's what we're cooking these on. And what I did was I used a little bit of clarified butter because clarified butter you can use at high temperatures and it has a wonderful flavor. But you can also use, with this particular corn cake, you could use sunflower oil. You could use a little bit of um, butter if you wanted to, or you could use olive oil. Still, my choice would be clarified butter. And we have three different types of corn cakes, as you saw me making. One has Italian herbs in it, another has cumin in it, and the third one, which I made while we were off, was with Indian spices. So I had some mixed Indian spices in it. So there was toasted cumin and toasted coriander and a little bit of toasted fennel. Very, very nice. Now, the key to making this an absolutely luscious dish is to finish it properly. So what we're going to do after we finish cooking these, and we actually have already prepared some, and Kathy's going to show you the toppings that we make on and the toppings also go with the different herbs and spices that we've used within the individual corn cakes. Okay, so we've come up with some toppings to coincide with how Steve has spiced our corn cakes. We have three different types of corn cakes and, and a number of toppings here. The first one we made was the um, Mexican corn cake. And for that, Steve used toasted cumin. Mm. And um, I've made a guacamole, a very simple guacamole with um, cilantro and tomato and jalapeno and lemon and mm. salt. Mm. Um, for the second corn cake, I've used, we've, it, was Mex it was the Italian corn cake, excuse me, the Italian corn cake. Um, and that one has oven roasted tomatoes and shaved Parmigiano Reggiano. For the oven roasted tomatoes, I have simply sliced tomatoes, put them on a cookie sheet with olive oil, salt, and pepper, and baked them at 350 for about 45 minutes. 
concentrated the flavors, made them very, very tasty. Right, and then we always marinate them in olive oil, which really makes it, it's great to drizzle that olive oil on top of the cake it's because easy. it will um, really add flavor. And only extra virgin olive oil. Exactly. There are lots of reasons, but just remember, when you buy olive oil, just buy extra virgin olive oil. Mm. The third one, which is this cake, is the one that Steve spiced with Indian spices. Mm -hmm. And for that, he used a garam masala, and we're going to add on top of that a raita, which is a cucumber yogurt um, toasted cumin concoction. And then we're putting a chutney on top. Today I've done shredded uh, unripe mango with apricots and cilantro and uh, mustard seeds. So there we have three different, three different varieties um, with a simple corn cake. Chapati, I think you're really going to like this one. I want to try. <laughs> Very much. So, Jeffrey, is there anything you want to give us a final word of wisdom here? Okay, well right now we have three at-risk ingredients here. We have the corn, the zucchini, and the yellow squash, although the yellow patty pan squash may not be genetically engineered. It might only be the crookneck squash. I actually don't know. Mm. But if we're not careful, if we're not vigilant, that each of these items here will become genetically engineered in the future. This is the actual stated goal of the biotech industry, to genetically engineer 100% of all the commercial seeds mm. in the world mm. and patent them. Now, fortunately, consumers are becoming aware about the health dangers. So they're buying specific products and brands that don't have GMOs in them. And that is what, that is what forced it out of Europe, and that's what's going to force it out of the food supply in the United States. Mm -hmm. So we can all enjoy healthy, non-GMO choices day after day. Mm. Very important, very important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Okay, so would you like to try one of our cakes? What are they again? They're Italian, Mexican, and Indian. I'll try the Indian. Somehow I knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to put on our toppings, our raita, and our chutney. And there you go. <laughs> Very good? Very good. Non-GMO. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching with our wonderful guest, Jeffrey Smith, the expert on GMO. Wonderful Kathy Dubois, our wonderful cook, and our wonderful guest chef, this is Steve Boss. I'm your host, Chapati. We'll see you very soon. Remember, eat healthy, eat organic, and eat non-GMO. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching Food with Life. 